There's a lot of things in metal that are deemed silly or like melodramatic, but there's a certain honesty in that, you know. Um, there's a certain honesty in the fucking picked on loner fucking screaming his head off and playing powerful guitar, you know what I mean? So, I'm not saying that everybody is a picked on loner that makes metal, but some of the things that, that appeal to me about it, so. Black metal has always been outsider art in its most brutal form. Back in the 80s, European bands like Venom, Bathory, and Celtic Frost were the first to release these kinds of violent, lo-fi records filled with blast beats, satanic imagery, and shrieking vocals. As black metal birthed the second wave out of Norway and a third wave from the US, the most compelling figures to emerge out of the genre's evolution are the true loners. Artists who play all their own instruments and don't just scream about isolation and misanthropy, but live it. These one-man black metal bands convey a rage and emotional noise that make the people who conceive them even more fascinating. This is who we set out to find. Three living, one-man black metal artists who have never before given the public a peek into their solitude. The gold standard of U.S. black metal is Leviathan, a band created solely by Jeff Whitehead under the guise of an entity called Rest. As Leviathan, Whitehead built songs with layers of complex instrumentation and vocals that sound like the strangulated howls of the devil. Jeff has always been adverse to publicity. Leviathan has never played live leaving almost 30 releases over a dozen years to speak for themselves. For a long time, you were just completely inaccessible. I had a hard time finding you. Everybody I tried to, you know, when I was trying to track you down, everybody was like, you'll never find him. You'll never find Jeff Whitehead. He's fallen off the face of the earth. Well, because I don't, I don't own a computer, so I don't answer my emails. I never look at them. I don't have time for that, and I just, I'm not into sharing. It's a life that has forced Jeff into an almost solitary existence. Self-taught on first drums and then guitar, at an early age, he was already developing an insane work ethic. One that removed him from the everyday reality of his life and dictate that he focus only on learning and creating. Whether he was playing in math rock or punk bands, Jeff never relented on developing the intense and absolutely brutal sound of what would later be called Leviathan. I've always been in bands that I wish were harder. I wish were fucking more punishing. I wish were more crushing. And um, that band Gift Horse I was in in the early 90s, I would always like suggest songs, and he was always telling me to get a four track, and I got my four track. So. I was just doing it for me, I was just doing it, you know? And I'm like, whoa, I'm making music that I would actually like to listen to, so I get them. A lot of the reason why I never worked with anybody else, because like when I was really hot shit and doing all that, putting out all those demos, I was like, I don't want to wait for somebody. I want to fucking do it now. I want to do it every chance I have. And so doing that in my house was a way to do that. I've always wanted Leviathan to be 
fast. Leviathan's not that fast, but it's as fast as I can play. Um, the older I get, the harder it is to play like fast for long periods of time. I've always wanted Leviathan to deal with like the more of a left-handed path aspect, you know, um, not levee Satanism, but you know, anger and just kind of be more ferocious. And then like the other stuff I've done is just like a little bit mellower and like more relaxed and less less of an objective for the final outcome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just whatever happens, happens. Tracking Jeff down for this project took months. When we finally got in touch with Jeff, he was tattooing at a shop in Chicago. So I made an appointment with him and got a tattoo. It's the artwork from Leviathan's album, Howl Mockery at the Cross. I guess he realized we were serious about getting him on camera, so he invited us out to his place in Oakland. Me with, I was 23, it's like barely any tattoos. Me getting tattooed by Hariyoshi in Japan by hand. Shit. I was on a soccer team called the Darth Vaders. Yeah. Nineteen seventy eight. San Jose. Is that you right there? Yeah. Nice. Can we talk at all about growing up? It seemed like it took forever. I was born in Stanton, California, in a hospital in Stanton. Lived in Huntington Beach. Moved to San Jose right before first grade. Eighth grade, moved to Santa Cruz. Got kicked out of 10th grade in high school. Why'd you get kicked out of 10th grade? I'm paying the ass. I just kept getting in trouble, so. Then I ran away from home. My dad lived in Oakland, I ran away up there. Why did you leave your mom's house and go live with your dad? Because I got in trouble at school and I knew I was gonna be in for it. When I got home, I just didn't want to deal with it. You know, just, you know, right. the stepdad, all that. Oh, uh, right, yeah. So you, you went up to live with your dad in Oakland? Yeah, that didn't work out. I became a ward of the court, which means that your parents don't want you at their houses, so you are in group homes. First group home I was in in San Francisco was run by this guy, Father, Father Gregory. He's a Greek Orthodox priest. And he was hiring guys straight out of SQ, you know, straight out of Quentin. Of San Quentin. To be counselors. These guys are getting us baked and showing us titty magazines the whole bit, you know what I mean? Like, you know, shaking, you're shaking your head and going, no, but like at the time, I was like, awesome. <laughs> this guy showed me how to roll a crutch. I'm smoking weed, awesome, you know? Like, so, um, but looking back on you it, it's understand. probably not I mean, that the, does uh, not make any sense. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't, but he was... Ex-prisoners. He, he probably, you know, paid him and you can eat as much as you want or something, you know? And they were, they were pretty fucked up. What was that? I think it was like... Just about to turn 16, and uh, I had fucked up the last one in San Francisco. I'd been in three in San Francisco, and this was the last straw. And they were going to send me to a boys' home in Modesto, and I was like, fuck that. And I just took off, took my skateboard, and went and stayed at friends' houses. Jeff spent the late 80s homeless, living on people's couches, all the while making a name for himself as a skater. He wound up in a bunch of skate magazines, and even on the cover of Nintendo Skate or Die 2. I started skateboarding and getting good like right after street style, like Mark Gonzalez and Tommy Guerrero. I went to high school with Tommy Guerrero. And those guys were just doing all this crazy stuff on the street. Then 1990 rolled around. 
invert was out. It was all street. Like, so if you didn't skate street, you were out. So all these amazing vert skaters had nothing, they had nowhere to go. But yeah, it was, it was a, it was a great time. It was a great time. When he wasn't skating or getting busted for it, Jeff was designing skate graphics and logos. I sold this to Thunder Trucks in 91 for 50 bucks. They still use it, and I got no fucking money. I mean, considering the fact that it's their icon and they're still using it, where's my money? Uh, poor Ashbury, uh, where I lived for about 10 years. Is this where you recorded like all the early demos and yeah. like 10 sub-level of Suicide and all, the, all those records? Yeah, uh, I recorded everything up to Tentacles of Horror here. A long period of time, I got up, went and got coffee, work on music, go to work. This is when I worked in North Beach, go to work. Work all day, come home and work, work on music until I went to sleep, you know, that's all I did, really. I uh, poured everything into that. It was, it was the only release I had, you know? All I wanted to do was make music. Like, I would leave work early sometimes. There was, like, no, like social, no social interaction with, like, a lot of people, or no, it was just, I don't, like... Well, I, don't, I'm not, I don't fucking... I don't go out, I don't go to bars, I don't go to... Sh I don't even go to a lot of shows just because I fucking can't stand being around people. I've had some pretty, pretty intense experiences in this building. And I saw, I don't know, I just seen, I've seen some crazy shit in that room. Completely so. And it would make you feel like uptight and... Well, it's just, it's kind of weird to even talk about, you know, because it's like, I don't, I don't know if I can articulate right. exactly what the experience was like. But uh, it was pretty freaky. Um, yeah, I spent a lot of time, I lived here for 10 years. Went through a lot of shit in that room right there. And when did you, when did you leave? Like what was the, what, what were the circumstances under, like how you left? Uh, I tried to end my life in that room right there. Um, didn't work out, so. And then I ended up uh, moving to Oakland. It's a long story that's really not for other people. So. Leviathan has always been an outlet for Jeff's pain and aggression, but in 2001 he released a different kind of demo under the name Lurker of Chalice. The music remained really dark, but expressed a more complex range of sounds and emotions. If I were to do Leviathan live, I would play drums and somebody else would sing. It would be like a Leviathan cover band, you know, it'd be weird. So, um, that's kind of why that's never happened. I've never, never want to be the guy who like has to show somebody all the guitar parts and all that stuff. And when did uh, like the Lurker of Chalice stuff start coming into play? Just like, it's just a, like other, mu other music I have in me that's not, you know, you know. Right, right. Leviathan is like all that anger and fucking hatred I can fucking muster. And it's not hard to muster, but it's like, it's, that's where that comes from. And Lurker was, a, there was, yeah, there was a muse for Lurker uh, at the time when, so, uh, she's dead. So that's probably, I don't think Lurker will happen again. That's when Jeff started opening up to me off camera. In 2006, his longtime girlfriend Jessie was diagnosed with brain cancer. After a year of extreme pain, she committed suicide. Oh, it's Jessie. Every time she stayed in my house, she'd always write me because I'd leave at work, and she'd stay in bed. She'd always write me a note. I'll save them all. 
Jeff then tried to take his own life. He survived, but hasn't recorded any new Leviathan or Lurker tracks since. <laughs>